Hello again. It's I was about to say it's that time, but we're a little bit later. Apologies to Open Secrets, obviously. So hopefully you all know who Martin Luther is. You're not mixing him up with Martin Luther King or Idris Elba, who is Luther, John Luther. Um, okay, so Luther. We're going to have a little look at his motivation. Uh, obviously, I don't think he foresaw the Reformation as a result of his uh, integrity or his integrative uh, search for meaning within the gospel. And I'm going to skip right into it. Uh, I'm also going to make available um, an entire like Christian history magazine. That will be free in Discord. So there's another promise I've made without making arrangements to do that. But Cherokee and Open Secrets will definitely remind me, she said, hopefully. Okay, so let's have a little look, see. And uh, I've already said my prayers and I pray that I will be able to read this in a way that is edifying uh, for somebody. <clears throat> so the title of this, this is written by Timothy George and the title is Contemplate Christ. And it's basically about Luther's theology and how it emerged from his own struggles, I guess, rather than a reactionary kind of. Anyway, let's find out. Stop waffling, Kay. One day in 1511, quite a while ago, Luther and his monastic mentor, who was Johann Staupitz, I'm going to just apologise right now for my uh, German pronunciations, sat under a tree uh, near their cloister in Wittenberg, which is in Germany and is where Luther was a monk. So the vicar general of the Augustinian order told the young at that time, Luther, that he should become a professor of theology and a preacher. And as you imagine, uh, this young man, Luther, was quite taken aback and said, it will be the death of me. Uh, to which Staupitz replied, that's quite all right. God has plenty of work for clever men like you to do in heaven. So Luther did receive his doctorate, his doctor's degree, just over a year later, so he didn't hang about. Um, and that was in October of 1512. That day, he also received a woolen beret, a silver ring, two Bibles, one open, one closed, as was the custom, and a commission to be a sworn doctor of Holy Scripture. So that's quite pivotal. That's quite important in understanding the man Luther, that he'd taken this sacred oath to be a sworn doctor of the Holy Scripture. Uh, and as we know, uh, he took that commission very seriously. It guided his theology, his career as a reformer also. And uh, it meant that he uh, was less likely to recant anything that he did not see as the truth. OK, so years later, <coughs> excuse me, years later. Um, sorry, I've just skipped out a minute. Two seconds. Years later, he, that helps when knowing who's saying what, he declared, what I began as a doctor, I must truly confess to the end of my life. I cannot keep silent or cease to teach. It's pretty much my problem. In his view, the Reformation happened because, this is critical as well, it's not because of his objection, because the Pope tried to hinder him from fulfilling his vocation of expounding the scriptures and obviously to go back on his sworn uh, oath that he had taken. So though he held a doctor's degree, Luther was no mere member of a learned guild of scholastic theologians. His theology grew from his own anguished quest, and we can look at that another time, uh, suffice to say that he would spend hours in confession. He was a very deep thinker and he had a sense of anxiety almost, uh, you know, in order to fully understand God's purpose for him and that he was getting everything right, if that makes sense. So for him, theology was not just an academic study. That's really important. It wasn't just the study of religion or God. Um, rather, it came out of his reading and thinking during a lifelong process of struggle and temptation. He was quite open about stuff like that. So as Luther never tired of saying, only experience makes one a theologian. I did not learn my theology all at once, he said, but I had to search deeper for it where my temptations took me. 
Um, and we can reference Paul for, for the existence of temptations as Christians, certainly. Um, not understanding, reading or speculation, but living. Nay, dying and being damned make a theologian. So out of Luther's struggles emerged a theology that literally shook the foundations of medieval Christendom. I think that's that's not an overstatement at all. Though Luther appreciated the protests made by such forerunners as uh, John Wycliffe in, in England and uh, Jan Hus of Bohemia, he recognised his own efforts as qualitatively different. So he, yeah, he, he didn't always agree with all Protestant uh, reformers. So Luther's protest actually began well, Luther's protest against Tetzel's sale of indulgences. So you may, if you've seen my previous video on that, basically uh, there were some dude, well, there were many dudes, uh, but, you know, someone just running around like a salesman, like an ice cream salesman, selling pieces of paper that were basically licenses to commit sin. That's the only way I can think of it. Uh, you could buy them for somebody else. You could buy them for your nan, uh, you know, for your second cousin, uh, twice removed. And they basically exempted you from any uh, consequent of the sins that you may commit, that you had commit, that you were committing. So what's the point, really? And the point is that you're already forgiven. Lots of these like medieval and uh, historic simplifications of the theology that was used, for example, in the Crusades, I'm often quite glad I wasn't there because I would have been shouting out, you don't need to, you're already forgiven. Okay, so it started. The, the catalyst for him was the indulgences. Um, and his initial protest in 1517 did more than call for church reform. It challenged church identity, actually. Um, his radical views were crystallised by later interpreters into three statements on scripture, faith and grace that everyone will have heard of. Once I get to them, you'll realise what I mean. That set the stage for, for all the reformers that came after him and the ones that were, uh, you know, concurrent with him. So sola scriptura, uh, hopefully, if you're a Christian and you're watching, you know what this is. It's scripture alone. So at the Diet of Worms, that is not some sort of faddy diet. That's a meeting in a place called Worms. Worms is how uh, this English person pronounces it. That was in 1521. That was 500 years ago this year. Um, and it was, I think, April 12th. But I don't know if we're going to get into that. On April 12th, I will do an anniversary kind of thing. But anywho. At the Diet of Worms, in reference to Sola Scriptura, in 1521, Martin Luther declared his conscience captive to the word of God. But that declaration did not mark his decisive theological break with the Church of Rome. Like few people seem to realise, he adhered to what we now consider specifically Roman Catholic doctrine. I won't say interpretation of scripture because it's it's not there, quite frankly. But, yeah, he held to those, lots of those views until his death, even though he'd been excommunicated. So that didn't, yeah, that didn't mark his break with Rome. That had already happened um, two years previously in 1519 at Leipzig. No, it's not Leipzig. Um, and that's two years after his 95 theses, and that was a list of statements which he wished to debate, 95 of them, the clues in the title, and he nailed it to the church door, as one does after a couple of drinks. I'm only joking. <clears throat> okay, so please don't nail stuff on church doors. Right, so his opponent in the Leipzig debate was an accomplished professor at the University of Ingolstadt, and his name was Johann Eck, uh, so an onlooker who was there, sympathetic to Luther, um, was the humanist scholar Petrus Mussolanus, and this is how he described eyewitness account um, of the dramatic, you know, like standoff. So he said, Martin is of middle stature, his body thin and so wasted by care and study that nearly all his bones may be counted. 
He is in the prime of life. His voice is clear and melodious. His learning and his knowledge of scripture are so extraordinary that he has nearly everything at his fingers ends. Greek and Hebrew, he understands sufficiently well to give his judgment on interpretations. And for conversation, he has a rich store of subjects at his command. Uh huh. So, right, he also, so Ek, his opponent, Mosolanus writes this, he has a huge square body, a full strong voice coming from his chest, fit for a tragic actor or town crier, and more harsh than distinct. So in German, Ek means corner, and he boxed Luther into one, basically. He pushed him into a theological corner, We'll get to that. He forced Luther to say that popes and church councils could err, as in could make mistakes, and that's uh, antithetical to Roman Catholic, like Roman Catholic doctrine. If the pope says the magic words or whatever he does, puts the puts the special hat on, stands on one leg. I don't really know what he does, but when he speaks ex cathedra or infallibly as the voice of God, not Metatron, but like a, you know like a continuation of Peter, he's not supposed to be able to make a mistake in, in that worldview, in that version of Christianity. But he forced Luther into saying that, yes, popes and church councils could make mistakes and that the Bible alone could be trusted as an infallible source of Christian faith and teaching. So that's it's quite an interesting uh conclusion to come to although I would obviously not obviously many of you don't know me I would side with that over and above any like mere human being as it were I mean people for sure revelation uh you know d plays a massive part in in how Christianity is shaped like post-biblical revelation however if it's a toss-up between a dude in a dress a load of dudes with big beards and dresses etc and the the breathed word of God, like, yeah, Bible, sola scriptura, as it were. <laughs> Excuse me. So under duress, and for anyone who doesn't know, that means he's under pressure. He doesn't really want to be saying it, but he's under duress. Luther articulated what would come to be the formal principle of the Lutheran Reformation. All church teaching must be judged by the Bible. There's nothing... Like at the time, this was ridiculously, um, you know, basically it was heretical because they'd gone so long on traditions, etc. But we haven't seen him yet as anti-traditionalist, in my opinion. I just see him as pro-Bible, uh, pro-scripture. Because to be fair, the traditions or the traditions in the making or the actions of the church at that time in selling indulgences, selling get out of jail free cards, you might as well say, um, yeah, it's not biblical. There's nowhere in the Bible that that's a thing. Um, so, yeah, good on you, Martin. Right, let's find out what happened. So he ended his official statement to Eck and he said this, I am sorry that the learned doctor only dips into the scripture as the water spider into the water. Nay, that he seems to flee from it as the devil from the cross. I'm going to stop you there, Martin. It's a bit like inflammatory. Anyway, he's just like, compared this dude uh, to the devil fleeing from the cross, as one does. I prefer, he continued, with all deference to the fathers. So there you go. He's not saying, who's this mob? He's like, with all deference to church fathers, the, the fathers, he calls them. He is, of course, a modern church father himself now. The authority of the scripture, which I herewith recommend to the arbiters of our cause. So he's literally, like, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. He's recommending the Bible to these Christian judges of, um, of his actions and of our cause. So late medieval theologians, even those who sought reform, placed tradition alongside the Bible as a source. And for any non-Catholic, maybe non-Orthodox uh, Christian, like that's just, I don't, I genuinely don't understand it. I've thought about it, you know, I, I, I like the Church Fathers, but, not but. However, what I find most valuable about these historic voices of our faith is that because they disagreed with each other, 
often, they would write an entire book on why they disagreed, which is so useful because then you can either find a common uh, medium between the two set positions or you can come to your own, you know, like it's useful in terms of discussing long since decided upon theology and coming to your own spirit-led discernment and understanding of that. But the fact that they did disagree so often, so seriously, I mean, they still had, it depends who and, and at what point, but in the main, um, like Origen, for example, is quoted by Aquinas, even though they disagreed on a whole subset of um, like theological doctrine, they still, you know, he still refers to him as someone whose opinion matters more likely when he agreed with him, but that's not the point. The point is they are not a unified historical voice or institution whereas the Bible is unified completely in its in its message. That's just me going off on one for a change. Okay, so he did not, all right, let's see, hold on. Uh, yeah, he placed, they, they placed rather, tradition alongside the Bible as a source of church doctrine. And then the following year in the Babylonian captivity of the church, the title, Luther stated this. He said, what is asserted without the scriptures or proven relationship uh, revelation rather may be held as an opinion but need not be believed fair enough again if anyone has any objections i can't see the live chat at the moment but i'm happy to discuss it um and i've got nothing against uh catholics as my brothers and sisters at all one bit the pope yeah not so much all right so although i don't know him to be fair Luther did not reject tradition outright. He was not anti-traditionalist in the sense of like an anarchist or he just, you know, oh, down with that kind of thing. He, he doesn't reject it outright. He does actually, in my opinion, follow some traditions because I say they're actually not scriptural. Some of these views that are still held today by the Roman Catholic Church. He respected the writings of the early church fathers, particularly Augustine, and he considered universal statements of faith, such as the Nicene and the Athanasian creeds, binding on the church in his day. But he maintained that all creeds, uh, sayings of the fathers and decisions of church councils must be judged by, never sit in judgment upon the sure rule of God's word. Still nothing too controversial, but then I've, I've been brought up as a Protestant. So for Luther, the church was the creation of the Bible, um, born in the womb of scripture. For who begets his own parent, uh, Luther asked. Who first brings forth his own maker? Spoiler alert, no one. Um, he held a high view of the inspiration of the Bible, calling it once the Holy Spirit book. Oh, that's quite nice. Right, so arguably, Luther's greatest contribution to the Reformation was his translation of the Bible into German. You wouldn't think it. I wouldn't think it. I've never read it in German. Eh, it, I'm glad that the writer says arguably, because I would probably argue against that. But he wanted common people, you know, the general populace, the uh, the farm farmers, milkmaids, I don't know, dustbin men. Psh, I don't, I don't know what medieval German like peasantry did, but he wanted people who were not well educated and basically rich um, to feel the words of scripture in the heart. And that's so very important because like I've said before, Muslims can have a copy of the Bible. They can know it inside out, upside down, back to front. But it's just a book because without the Holy Spirit and without the, the change in heart and the metanoia, you know, it's just words on a page. And what truly distinguished his exegesis, exegesis is what you take out of the Bible, um, eisegesis is what you insert kind of uh, intellectually to make sense of things. But So what he took out of it, the meaning that he derived, um, was his ability to make the text come alive, basically. Um, and for him, Bible stories were not merely distant historical acts, but living current events as we see in his treatment of Gideon. So how difficult it was for Gideon to fight the enemy at those odds. If I'd been there, I would have messed in my breeches for fright. Oh, love him. Bless his little cottons. 
Um, his soiled cottons, to be fair. So for Luther, the Bible was no mere depository of doctrine. It was not a locked box. Things have been put in there and that's that. Bob's your uncle, you know, your aunt is, etc. So for Luther, the Bible wasn't just a, an archaic, like lock box um, a, and a repository or depository of doctrine. Um, in it, a living God confronts and saves his people. Big up God, as it were. Right, so Sola Fide now, and that, for anybody who's not Latin, there are no Latin people, who's not au fait with Latin, is faith alone. And obviously this can come from Ephesians, but we'll um, we'll have a look. And also Sola Gratia, which we're coming to. So Luther developed his understanding of justification amid both the moralism and the mysticism of late medieval religion. Um, he made strenuous genuine efforts to find a gracious God um, and he did penance according to the dictates of scholastic theology so ultimately he he despaired he became um, inured of it all like he like I said earlier he was in confession for hours and hours even the dude uh, the priest taking his confession was like you don't have to tell me every single little but he wanted to be sure and even though that's, to my mind, a work of the flesh kind of thing, like he, he sincerely and genuinely wanted to have everything out in the open and, and do as is advised and confess to our brothers and sisters, as it were. But ultimately, uh, one should confess to God. So he became frustrated. He, he despaired. And his illumination, as it were, came at some point during his scholarly labours. Um, he wrote shortly before his death, um, about this experience, which I'm discussing. He said, it's so sweet. He's such a lovely, oh. He said, at last, God being merciful, as I meditated day and night on the relation of the words, the righteousness of God is revealed in it. At, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I began to understand, and this was pivotal in his uh, reformatory works, I began to understand the justice of God as that by which the just lives by the grace of God, namely faith. And this sentence, the righteousness of God is revealed to refer to a passive righteousness by which the merciful God justifies us by faith as it is written, the just lives by faith. So this straight way made me feel as though I had been reborn. And as though I had entered through open gates into paradise itself. From that moment, I saw the whole face of scripture in a new light. And that's the metanoia I was, I was uh, talking about. And now where I had once hated the phrase, the righteousness of God, I began to love and extol it as the sweetest of phrases. So that this passage in Paul became the very gate of paradise to me. Oh, right. Luther considered justification by faith as the summary of all Christian doctrine. That's pretty like big potatoes, as it were. And the article by which the church stands or falls. There is a German word coming up, which I don't even want to help. OK, in the <laughs> in the Schmalkaldic articles, apparently in 1537, which could be considered his theological last will and testament, as it were, he wrote, nothing in this article can be given up or compromised, even if heaven and earth and things temporal should be destroyed. So according to the medieval understanding of justification, uh, which was derived from Augustine, who uh, he had a special place for, as it were, a person gradually uh, received or receives divine grace which eventually heals the wounds that have been um, are the result of the sin, basically. But Luther abandoned this medical image of impartation for the legal language of imputation. So God accepts Christ's righteousness, which we all know, which is alien to our fallen nature as our own. He accepts it's a replacement. It's an, yeah, basically. So, 
Though God does not actually remove our sins, he no longer counts them against us. And we know for a fact that that's biblical. God tells us, uh, he promises us, he will not see our sins uh, on judgment, not at the moment. He sees them all. So we are at the same time righteous and sinful. Here comes some Latin. Uh, simul justice et, et peccator, as Luther put it, because he was showing up that day. Um, Luther called this a sweet exchange between Christ and the sinner. Therefore, my dear brother, learn Christ and him crucified. Learn to pray to him despairing of yourself, saying, Thou, Lord Jesus, art my righteousness and I am thy sin. I've never thought of it that way, but that's actually true. Thou hast taken on thyself what thou wast not and hast given to me what I am not. Medi medieval theologians considered faith one of the three theological virtues, along with hope and love. They emphasised faith's cognitive content, intellectual assent to the doctrine, agreeing basically to the free gift of salvation via the doctrine, and saw that assent um, and saw that assent rather as a virtue formed by love. But he's such a troublemaker. But to Luther, such faith was not sufficient for salvation. Like, stop the press. Even demons have it, Paul wrote. They have knowledge, at least. Truly justifying faith, i.e. fiducia, um, as Luther named it, rather than fide, is something more, says Luther. It means taking hold of Christ, hearing and claiming God's promises as we have understood them and apprehending our acceptance by God in Christ Jesus. OK, few. <laughs> he's not changed every single thing about it, but something to ponder for sure. So now we're on to soli. Uh, no, we're not. Sola gratia, which is grace alone. Um, modern people often see Luther as the apostle of human freedom, apparently and the father of rugged individualism. Uh, but this view misunderstands his theological revolution, which it surely was. Similar to the revolution Copernicus would soon be causing, it hadn't even happened yet, within the scientific realm. You must know this story, surely. Copernicus, um, his calculations, which were published in 1543, removed the earth and, and by implication humanity from the center of created reality. Like and what, what we were discussing yesterday about worldviews, I mean, that's pretty big news, trust me. And also, at that, at, I believe, I might have my dates wrong. No, at this time, I think they viewed Jerusalem as the center of the earth, as it were. And uh, prior to Copernicus rocking up, uh, they thought that the earth was the center of uh, the created universe and everything revolved around us, humans and, and the planet. Okay, so, um, yeah, he removed it basically scientifically. Likewise, Luther's theology changed humanity's place in the process of salvation, um, i.e. you can't buy a ticket to it. So for Luther, salvation was anchored in the eternal, inscrutable purpose of God. He guarded against human-centeredness by insisting that God's grace comes from outside ourselves, duh, sorry, it does, um, not just a human possibility nor a dimension of the religious personality, but a radical and free gift of God who gives us even the grace to take a hold of the faith. Like, he, you know, we there are many places in the Bible where, it, you know, we are granted repentance. We're like God's always given us gifts that we don't deserve, quite frankly. Um, so this is the reason why our theology is certain, Luther explained. It snatches us away from ourselves and places us outside ourselves so that we do not depend on our own strengths, on our own conscience, on our own experience, on our own personhood or works. <laughs> I've got that the emphasis is mine. But... We depend on that which is outside of ourselves, that is, on the promise and the truth of God, which cannot be false and cannot deceive. Go on, Luther. Right. Luther's doctrine of the divine sovereignty 
and initiative in human salvation came to fullest expression in his famous debate with Erasmus, who is not only a bot on Discord, the actual Erasmus. Um, so they debated grace, free will, predestination. Uh, for Erasmus, humans, though fallen, remained free to respond to grace and thus cooperate in their salvation. Uh, Luther, however, saw the human will as completely enslaved by sin and Satan. I'm going to say it again. Erasmus believed that we had the free will to play a part in our salvation. I don't think he means by our own uh, goodness or anything, but just, you know, um, we are free to respond to that grace. And Luther said, oh, just a minute, bro. He didn't put it like that, though. He probably said it in German. But he said the human will, or he saw it as completely enslaved by sin and by Satan. We think we are free, is what he's saying, but we are only but we only, sorry, reinforce our bondage, our slavery, our chains, those of my additions, by indulging in sin. So grace releases us from this enslaving illusion and leads us into the glorious liberty of the children of God. I'm going to have to look into that one more before I uh, make a decision. God wants us to love him freely, Luther said. I'm with you on that, Loaf. But that is only possible when we've been freed from captivity to Satan and to self. Hmm. I'm not sure because of what Paul said, but I will, uh, yeah, we'll discuss it actually in Discord if anyone's interested or in the comment section. So finally, because I don't think we're doing uh, the five, I think it's just four in this. So solo, not solo, solo Christo. Um, for anyone who's not up on the old Latin, that's Christ alone. That doesn't mean without the Holy Spirit and the Father. It just means that the way. Let's find out what it means. Luther believed that the study of doctrine cannot be divorced from the art of argumentation. I knew I loved that geezer for a reason. He believed enemies without, and by without they mean outside of, um, and within the Christian church besieged the gospel, um, and that's still true today, and that he needed to set it forth in opposition to competing claims, like to get rid of interdenominational twaddle, as I like to call it. So Luther felt that each sola faces an enemy. Scripture alone, or sola scriptura, um, against scripture subordinated to a false understanding of tradition, Faith alone against faith achieved by human righteousness and grace alone against a theology that humans could merit or earn salvation. So they're all kind of Christian, pseudo-Christian sounding, you know, stuff that attacks these solas. Um, yeah, like a, on a spectrum, basically. Stated positively, each solar affirms the centrality of Jesus Christ. Christ alone. So each of the surrounding solas, as it were, um, affirm the truth of solo Christo. So first, uh, Luther states that Christ is the sole content of scripture and the principle for selectivity within scripture. And, um, you know, if anyone's just thought to themselves, well, hold on a minute, there's the Old Testament. Christ, I'll, I'll make a very short vid, um, is in every single book of the Bible, every single book of at least the, the Protestant uh, version. Uh, he's in every single book from Genesis to Revelation. He has a specific role in each book and he is there. So it's all of scripture. Yeah, it's the sole content of scripture and the principle for selectivity within the scripture. Famously, he criticised the epistle of James. I was having this chat only just today because it did not pro proclaim Christ sufficiently in Luther's view. Um, I've got a feeling it's about the works uh, kerfuffle. But also, yeah, so whatever does not teach Christ is not apostolic, even if St. Peter or St. Paul does the writing, is what Luther wrote. Again, Whatever preaches Christ would be apostolic, even if Judas, Annas, Pilate and Herod were doing it. It's interesting. 
So secondly, Christ is the centre of Luther's doctrine of justification by faith. And th this is by means of Christ's substitutionary death on the cross, substitutionary in the sense that we each deserve that punishment and yet he co collectively he took it all upon himself and he did not deserve it. Substitutionary atonement, basically, is uh, the, the posh way of saying it. Okay, so through Christ's substitutionary death on the cross, God acted to redeem fallen humanity. Um, in his large catechism, Luther wrote this, we could never come to recognise the Father's favour and grace were it not for the Lord Christ, who is a mirror of the Father's heart. They're so sweet. Like he's the express image of the Father and he is the embodiment also. This is not Luther, this is Kay saying it, of the Godhead uh, bodily. All right. Finally, the doctrine of grace can be approached only through the cross. Amen. Uh, through the wounds of Christ, to which Staupitz, do you remember he's debating at the beginning, uh, 500 years ago at the beginning, as it were, had directed the young Luther in his early struggle. Sorry, he wasn't debating him. He was telling him it will kill me. Almost. Um, Luther's words to Barbara Liskirchen, potentially, who worried she was not among God's elect, are words he could have spoken to himself as well. And this is what he said to Babs. The highest of all God's commands is this, that we hold up before our eyes the image of his dear son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Every day he should be the excellent mirror wherein we behold how much God loves us and how well in his infinite goodness he has cared for us in that he gave his dear son for us. Contemplate Christ given for us. Then... God willing, you will feel better. All right, let me come back to the chat. Three, no, at half time. Shucks. Right, let me not get distracted away from Jesus. Um, okay, so, hi, Villainous. Right, so that is a summary of basically the solas and the solo, as it were, but also why in my opinion luther is not a um just merely he doesn't just have a problem with the traditions of the catholic church there were specific actions there were specific doctrines but as i said earlier he adhered to some of what we now consider um very catholic -y sort of stuff um he carried on believing that um so he wasn't just out to you know he didn't see I don't believe he saw Catholicism as the problem. He definitely had an issue with the Pope. He definitely had an issue with, um, what's the word? What's the phrase? Tradition that had no uh, foundational presence within scripture. And I think that's kind of fair enough, as we know that the human heart and, you know, the wiles of men, etc., take us down these weird little uh, colder sex of theology so okay so that's that and I hope I really do hope actually that that some questions have been raised in your minds if you have any discord or the comment section please also I think potentially I'm going to do maybe just an open kind of lecture as it were maybe just a short reading and then any questions that you've gathered over the past few weeks that you've been with me while I've been at least on YouTube doing them rather than Discord. Although anyone who's been with me from the off, <laughs> Villainous, Open Secrets, Cherokee, etc., is free to ask questions on any of the uh, any of the stuff. But I for sure from as of January the 1st, I have all of the literature and all of the stuff that I've done. So I can make that available somehow if you're in Discord. Also, if you, the Christian History magazine I just used for that article, that will be freely available in Discord. Also, uh, Go England, they're playing football at the moment. Um, what else? Subscribe, like, share, reform your theology. <laughs> I'm really joking. Um, have a look into Luther. Like I said, 500 years since he was um, excommunicated. Didn't do him much harm, to be fair. Uh, so one up against uh, the Pope of the time. But yeah, have a look. It's the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation has already happened, but it's culmination where he was forced, well, 
they tried to force him to recant is coming up in April. So we'll do some stuff about that. Any questions about his doctrine, uh, let me know. Any suggestions for any topics also? So if you're in Discord, you can DM me, direct message for anyone who's over 12. Um, and yeah, any suggestions? Um, I'm down with that. So I have one question here. Okay, what do you think of apologists like Sam Shimon, basically, who frequently disparage Protestantism? I think Sam, I, I like Sam. Sam's a, I say friend. We do fall out uh, occasionally. Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> okay, let me try and be a little bit diplomatic. I would say that if I'm put in a corner, I don't often uh, challenge the Roman Catholic or Orthodox tenets with which I disagree. However, if they come up, and sometimes that's because I've just brought them up, um, I will have a little go because I'm pretty secure in the case that I can make or that the, the case that the Bible makes, as it were. I don't think that Sam makes a point do you know what I mean? I don't think that's his raison d'etre, as it were. Uh, he's, I like Sam. I like Sam a lot. I've prayed for him a lot. I think that he has a, thankfully, unique way of speaking with people in his live chat sometimes. Although, <laughs> although, God bless him. Um, yeah, someone else who knows him put it to me like this. They said that basically his mind is so full of knowledge that potentially some people's skills get um, left on the back burner. But he's a sweetie, actually. He's he's a nice guy. And it actually doesn't matter what he thinks about Protestantism. It doesn't matter what I think about Catholicism. It's not between you and I. It's not between Sam and I. It's not between you and other people in the comment or your church or the body of Christ. It's between each one of us and God. So that um, that helps a lot. That helps to maintain the uh, love that we're commanded to build to each other instead of getting all antsy and aggy over um, like, you know, stuff that's potentially been settled by a smack in the mouth by St. Nicholas a long time ago. Okay. Sam is a blessing to the body of Christ. Amen to that. I like him a lot. Um, yeah, I don't get to watch him enough uh, because it's always the middle of the night for me when he's on often right so i think i dodged that bullet pretty well uh any other questions before i jump ship uh oh, and also i've really impressed myself actually i've learned well i didn't try before but i've learned how to put the animation on the back of my cs lewisy things by myself so expect a whole raft of like the rest of the screw tape letters probably and and other C.S. Lewis stuff and any audio actually that I've ever done that's been sitting in my uh, computer for ages. So that's good. Okay, just general statements. I, I don't know how to expand on them. I am available in Discord. The link is in the description box. If it's not, it will be at some point. Also, there are links to my Patreon, my Rumble, what else is in that little description box? I can't remember. Patreon, Rumble, Parlor. Uh, I think that's it. And, um, yeah, there'll be more persecution bits coming soon because 137 people were uh, mercilessly slaughtered very recently. I do not want to end on a down note. So what I will say is, um, is God, genuinely, I pray that you are blessed that the Holy Spirit has a real presence and uh, influence in your life. Please don't be embarrassed to ask questions. I answer enough from Muslim polemicists who don't even care for the answer. So obviously I'm even more willing to uh, help anyone out if they feel that I'm all right to, you know, that I'm, I'm the guy for the job as it were. Other than that, I can surely point you to somebody else. Speaker's Corner is uh, a thing on Sunday, so I shall see you all there, and I will see you, will I, will I, will I? Yes, tomorrow, Friday is women's, but now that we've expanded to YouTube, I guess it's going to be mm, centred on some Christian women other than me, but like historical Christian women maybe, but any new ladies to the uh, YouTubes, 
um, please make sure you're in Discord tomorrow and you'll see the announcement in the events folder. Uh, and that's it. I'm going to press the first button. Okay, for anybody who's having any problems with Christians, I'm, I'm only just scanning the live chat. Uh, don't don't sever yourself from all of us. Uh, there's a brilliant thing in technology. You just block, you just block people, and then you don't see the person who's causing you the uh, it's like stumbling block. But you're able to still receive the support and the love uh, that we all are commanded to give to each other. And some of us just do it for fun. So that's my advice. And uh, yeah, repent, please. Uh, pray, subscribe, share, comment, confess your sins. Have a laugh. I mean, what is the point in getting saved to be miserable? There isn't one. All right, lots of love. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.